Have you ever been overwhelmed by the number of options you have to pick from? We all want to have a choice, but there are times where we've realized that sometimes we don't want too many choices. And if we get too many choices, it can be too much to deal with. To go to an American grocery store for rice, you don't just have rice there. You've got 50 different options. You've got different grains. You've got different sizes. You've got different price points. Some of them are on sale. Others you can use a coupon for, but to do that, you have to buy two of them. And then there's a rewards number you can enter for more money. But if you buy that on Tuesday, then you get double rewards on that day. Now, you'd think that something like buying rice would be easy, but even that can be difficult. It can be an intimidating choice, especially the first time you go to that grocery store for rice. See, there's so many things that we need to consider and weigh when we're making a choice. And then we're supposed to be applying that, in the case of rice, to 50 different options. We don't really like making choices like these. Uh, we get nervous we're gonna make the wrong choice and it's especially nerve wracking if we know that we're buying it for somebody else and that, that that person is gonna be pretty particular that we need to buy exactly the right kind. I'm not saying that's how I feel when I go to the grocery store. My wife is very gracious. Uh, but sometimes there are situations like that and it's nerve wracking to have to make that kind of choice because you have to make sure you make the right one. Well, we can feel something similar when we step into the American spiritual marketplace. Not only are there in America so many different religions and spiritualities out there, but even just within the Christian section of spiritualities, there are so many different versions of Christianity that are being offered to us. There are more than 200 denominations of Christianity just here in the U.S., along with tens of thousands of other churches who are not affiliated with any denomination. Alongside these churches, there are countless Christian books, Christian websites, all of which claim the name of Christ. And when you look closer at these options that are all out there, what you see is that they're not all the same. There are actually a lot of differences between them. There are all kinds of different beliefs uh, out there different ways that these different versions of Christianity are responding even to basic questions like, who is Jesus? Who is God? Who are we? What are we here to do? And uh, I think for a lot of us, it's, it's confusing. We wonder, okay, which, which one's right? Which one's wrong? And it can be a challenge to our faith, really. Because once you realize the sheer diversity of Christianity, or what people call Christianity, in terms of the people who identify as Christians, what tends to happen is that you start to question whether you really know the Bible and whether you really are going to a good church or a bad church. Maybe even whether you're really a Christian. There are all these different beliefs out there, Christian beliefs about these things. And so what tends to happen is that this kind of fog starts to set in and you're just not sure where you are or where you're heading or what you need. Maybe you're in a season like that, even today, where you're starting to question and doubt some of the things that you've been taught about Christianity. Perhaps you're someone who's gone through this in the past. Sometimes um, it, it's something that many of us go through. It might be somebody who is going to go through this in the coming years. It's quite common for Christians to have a time of, of uncertainty in their faith, of doubt. But you need to know this particular fact. God always takes care of his children. When God puts you into that fog, when he leads you into that spiritual fog, he is still there with you. And he is going to lead you out of it. He doesn't abandon you in there. No, he, he gives you his word and his spirit, if you're his child, 
guide you through it. He is there with you and he will see you through to the other side until you get to that new place of spiritual clarity and understanding in your faith. We are never alone in the fog as God's people. He is with us. And if we will listen to his voice, he will lead us out of the fog and into a place of clarity and confidence in our faith. This is what we're going to see in God's word this morning. I'm going to see how this plays out with respect to two different kinds of doubt that Christians often experience at some point in their walk with Christ. So let's pray that God would use his word this morning to teach and encourage us and to show us that way forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you needing guidance for so many different things in our life, needing understanding, needing to see our flaws, needing to trust you more. And we know that we, in every way, have no right to claim these things from you. We are not in ourselves uh, people who deserve to have you hear us. And yet we thank you that in Christ you do. And so we come and we ask you, Father, to meet our need this morning, to give us uh, your light so that in your light we might see the light and be led out of the fog and into a place of greater clarity and understanding and confidence in our faith. Would you teach us and train us by your word this morning and show us the way you would have us walk we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first kind of doubt that John addresses in our passage is one that's extremely common. Almost every Christian goes through this season of doubting. At some point, after you become a Christian, you start to wonder, wait, did that work? Am I really a Christian? You know, some who say that they're Christians say, well, you know, you're a Christian if you believe certain things about Jesus. Other people might tell you it, it depends on whether you get baptized as a Christian. That's what would make you a Christian. Others would say you're a Christian, you know, if you live like Jesus. If you talk to a, a Catholic, they would say you need to become Catholic to become fully Christian. You need to go to mass and mass and take the sacraments and so on. So who's right? What is a Christian? And are you a Christian? There's a time in high school when I started to doubt whether I was really a Christian. It was kind of a unique, specific time. Uh, it was actually just like one night. Uh, I was at this conference and uh, I was there with my youth group from church. And there was a speaker at the conference who said, be, he basically said, if you want to be a real Christian, then you need to receive the Holy Spirit. You need to start speaking in supernatural tongues. That's what God wants for you. That's what God's people really do. And so he, he invited everybody up to the front, and he was going to pray that those people would receive the Holy Spirit. And I started to doubt at that moment whether I really was a Christian or if I really wasn't quite a Christian yet, if there was you know, this other thing that I still needed to do to be a real Christian. Well, let's take a look at what God actually tells us in our Bible about what a real Christian is and how to, how to identify one. Look at the first part of our passage, verses 19 through 24 of First John chapter 3. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he 
has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and in him. And by the us, the spirit whom he has given us. There are times in a Christian's life where their heart, their own heart, is actually condemning them. The Bible says that the human heart is deceitful and exceedingly wicked. And in some ways, even when the Christian gets a new heart from God, they may still hear this little voice inside them that says, you're not really a Christian. You haven't done enough. You're not good enough. Look at the sin in your life. You're going to need to do more if God's going to love you and accept you as his child. Those are the condemning words of our heart that we hear, even as Christians. But John says in verse 20, that when our heart is speaking these words of condemnation over us, God is also speaking to us. And when God speaks to us, he speaks with infinitely more authority and with infinitely better insight into who we are and into what he is talking about. God knows exactly what a Christian is, and he knows exactly what is going on in our heart and our life. And this is why John can say in verse 19 that it is possible to reassure our heart and gain a sense of confidence about where we stand with God. We just need to hear what God says, what he is saying to us with all authority and insight about who is really a Christian. So what is it that God says? His answer comes to us in verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. If someone keeps God's commandments, they live in God and God lives in them by his spirit. Because they are a real Christian. So, if you are someone who is keeping God's commandments in your life, John's talking about an, an ongoing way of life. He's not saying that you are perfectly doing what God says. He recognizes you're still going to sin. But if you are sincerely striving to obey God in your life, to walk in obedience to God's commandments, that is an indication that you really are a Christian. Now, I need to be clear here. God makes it very clear in the Bible that this kind of obedience is not the way that someone is saved from their sins. We cannot just accumulate enough good deeds of obedience to outweigh our bad deeds of sin. Jesus alone can save us, and he won our salvation for us by living a perfect life and then dying for our sins on a cross so that we could be forgiven by his sacrifice. God says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, it is absolutely critical that you understand that your good works cannot save you. That is a key message of the Bible. Only Jesus' good work at the cross can save you. And if you put your faith in him, trusting him as your savior and as your Lord, then you will be united to him in a wonderful and mysterious way that will allow your sins to be transferred to him so that his atoning sacrifice pays for those sins. And at the same time, his righteousness becomes yours and you really are this person who is righteous because you are in Christ and united to him. All that happens by putting faith in Jesus Christ, not by doing good work. This is how people are saved, through Jesus, not by their own obedience. And yet at the same time, the Bible says very clearly, here and elsewhere, that if you do put your faith in Jesus like this, 
then you will start making changes to how you live. If you're a real Christian, you will want to obey God. You will try to obey God. And over time, you will learn to obey God more and more in your life. You'll change. But John says something important here. He says that if you have this desire to obey God, and if you are trying to obey God, not because you're trying to save, save yourself, but because Jesus has saved you and you're so grateful to God, this is evidence that you really are a Christian. He says, by this, we know that he abides in us. It's by the Spirit, he says. Only the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to work this kind of transformation in someone, to turn them from a rebellious sinner who doesn't want to live in God's way into an obedient saint who is striving to live according to God's commands. That kind of transformation can only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is only in Christians that the Holy Spirit works this transformation. So what is it specifically that you should be looking for to figure out whether you are a Christian and hopefully then reassure your heart? In verse 23, God summarizes the basic commandment that true Christians obey. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. A Christian is someone who trusts in Jesus and therefore seeks to obey his commands, which really are encapsulated in his command to love God and to love others. Their faith in Jesus is real, and so it leads them to really trust Jesus and to really respond to his commands by taking real action. They start to love others. They start to do this better and better over time in their life. They grow into the love of Christ. That's what a Christian does. When someone is living in God, when, when God is living in that person by his spirit, they are being transformed into a more perfect picture of Jesus Christ. And if that's happening in your life, that's evidence that you're a Christian. If you believe that Jesus, and that's the thing, there's two things here, two elements to this command. It's not just the love that John mentioned. He also mentions faith here. Two parts. If you believe that Jesus is God's own son, that he is the Christ who saved you by dying for your sins on the cross, that he rose again as the Lord whom you need to obey, if you believe that, trust in Jesus. And if that trust in Jesus is playing itself in your life, out in your life as you are trying to follow Jesus, so you're learning to love others, John says, don't let your heart condemn you then. Because your transformed life is evidence that you really are a Christian. And you should take comfort in that. God wants you to feel a sense of assurance and security in your faith. That God has already begun a good work in you. That you can rejoice over that and praise him for that. And that because he's already begun that good work in you, he is going to keep working in you until you die or Jesus returns. God doesn't want you to be worried and anxious all the time about your status with him if you're a Christian. Now, obviously, you don't have to, you don't, you can't stop following Jesus. You need to keep living in faith. But if you are living out a life of Christian love, not perfectly, but you're striving for it and you're walking in that. And if your trust at the same time is in Jesus Christ, in the fact that he saved you, not that you're saving yourself by these good works, then you don't need to be worried about your salvation. The Holy Spirit has changed your life. That's what your life is showing, the fruit of the Spirit. And that shows that he is living in you because you are a Christian. And because of this, what ends up happening 
is that God's will for your life is gradually becoming your will for your life. Your will is becoming God's will. Not because his will is changing to yours, but because your will is changing to his. You're learning to want what God wants and to desire what God desires. And this brings an added blessing to it that John mentions in verse 22. Insofar as your will becomes conformed to God's will, your prayers are going to be answered by God. Because you are learning to ask him only for the very things that he wants to give to you. So brothers and sisters, we are not just God's children. We are children who have the ear of our heavenly father. We are children whose requests he listens to and grants as we pray for his will to be done. And this is yet another kind of assurance that we can enjoy in Christ. To know that we are not only God's child, but that we are a child who has God's ear. And go to him in prayer at any time. And he will listen to us. On the other hand, though, if your trust is not in Jesus or if you are complacent and indifferent about Jesus' command to love others, if you don't really care and you're, you're not really working toward that, you're just prioritizing other things, you should be concerned about your spiritual status. It's time to examine whether you really are in Christ as a real Christian. It's not just that you have the right belief. If you have the right belief, it's going to lead to some right actions. And if it's not leading to that, there's a problem. You need to figure out what's going on. You need to respond to God's command by really trusting in his son, Jesus Christ, for your salvation. And then by committing yourself to obeying Jesus as your Lord. So that you actually start following Jesus and walking behind him and doing what he tells you to do. In the second half of our passage, John helps us navigate a second kind of doubt. At some point in our walk with Christ, most of us start to ask ourselves a different kind of question. We start to wonder, is my version of Christianity that I practice the right one? Oftentimes, it happens when you first get that sense of how many options there are out there that you could try, how many versions of Christianity are available. You start to question whether the Christianity you were brought up in as a child or the Christianity you entered into when you first became a Christian later on in your life, whether that is the best option, the one you should be embracing, or whether there's another better option out there that you should embrace. So you start to question whether what you've been taught about Christianity is right. And the practices that have been taught to you, whether those are right. And often it's in college or just after college that Christians start to have these kinds of doubts about their own practice of Christianity. Often it's because you know, they get exposed to different people, different people who call themselves Christians, and it really broadens their sense of, man, people, not everybody agrees with me on some of these things. Are they right? Am I right? What's the answer? We become insecure and uncertain. It can become a little bit disorienting because once you start to question some part of what you were raised in, in terms of what that church was teaching, you naturally then start to think, well, what about that thing though? But what about that? And then you start to question more and more things. And the more you kind of go down the road of questioning things, eventually you feel kind of like you're unmoored and you don't have even some of these basics of what you're, you're certain is true. You can kind of get yourself into a, a spiral of, of doubt and questioning. You can feel really scary sometimes. You feel like you're in this 
this fog of doubt and you're just not sure what is true and what is, what is Christianity or what kind of a Christian you should be. But here again, God speaks to this doubt with total authority and with perfect knowledge of what a Christian is and of what Christianity should be. And he tells us again, he leads us out of the fog here. John points out here three things that must be taught in a Christian church, no matter what. These are three essential teachings that are all core to Christianity. And they are true for every culture and in every time. And so these are things that if, if you're thinking about a church or joining a movement that doesn't embrace all three of these things, don't. Stay away from it. Because these things are core to Christianity. And if you discard these things, you discard the faith itself. So let's take a look at them. Uh, as a bit of background here, it's important to know from 1 John, he's writing to these churches that, uh, you know, where these, these Christians are aware of some different teaching that's been going on that Christians have been giving. There's some some false teaching really uh, that they've been hearing about. There were these false teachers that were in their church spreading some different ideas about Christianity. Uh, these teachers, they claimed to have superior insight into the Bible. They claimed to be the experts. They were proud, we see in this letter, they were unrepentant. Uh, you know, they, they acknowledged the need to love your neighbors. They acknowledged that Jesus said that, but you know, they didn't really practice that or think that they needed to do that because they were so focused on on getting spiritual insight that others didn't understand and this insight made them feel superior to the other christians and it, it made them think it was their duty to go around telling everybody about their secret insights into this teaching that they had now at some point these false teachers uh it seems from the letter they apparently leave the churches and they go and kind of start their own church. But even though they've left, their influence is still there. This teaching is still there. It's still influential in the churches. And, and people in these churches are, are still trying to process what is true, whose teaching is right, which one is, is really Christianity, what should I believe? They were starting to question. They were starting to have doubts about whether they already, they were really, you know, people who knew what was true. So John writes to give them some clarity and some insights. And in the things that he writes, we're able to get some sense of some of these elements of the teaching that he's kind of confronting here, this false teaching. And evidently there is a lot of prophecy that's going on here in these churches. Uh, people claiming that God had given them divine insight into these spiritual truths that they were speaking. But the question then was for these Christians, are these people who claim to speak God's truth telling us the truth? Are they really coming to us from God? Are they coming by the Holy Spirit? Or are they not from God at all? Because if they're from God, we need to listen to them. And if they're not, we need to not listen to them. How do we figure out if they're from God? How do we figure out what's true? John helps them now to get some clarity on this issue. And uh, he says that these teachers that were going around teaching this, they were not being inspired by the Holy Spirit because their teaching was contradicting three non-negotiable beliefs of Christianity. And that itself was evidence that they were not from God. He starts here with a reminder that you can't believe everything that you hear, even when it's coming to you from someone who claims to be a Christian. He says in verse one, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 
for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't just embrace what people tell you. You need to test every teaching you hear against what is true. And the way you test it is by testing it against what you know to be true, the Bible. If a new teaching contradicts the Bible, then it must be false. And John now applies this principle of how to test a spirit or test a teaching to this particular teaching that was being held or promoted in these churches. And in the process, he points out three non-negotiable beliefs that are part of Christianity that we just can't jettison. And those are ones that we need to be able to recognize and hold on to too. So let's take a look at those. Uh, the first two of them we find here in verse two. Take a look at that. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So, non-negotiable belief number one. Christianity claims that Jesus was fully human. Jesus says that if a person or John says that if a prophetic spirit is leading someone to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, in human flesh, that is, then that spirit is from God. But he's not really saying that in itself. He's using that to set up his point in verse 3. He's not saying anybody who says Jesus has come in the flesh is somebody you should believe in anything that they say. His point is to prove the flip side of this, that if somebody claims that Jesus did not come in the flesh, that he wasn't really human, then they are not speaking God's message. Because this belief in the humanity of Jesus is an absolute non-negotiable when it comes to Christianity. It's something we can't discard. Now, in our day, it's not controversial to claim that Jesus was fully human. But in John's day, this was controversial. There was a heretical movement in the area called docetism. It comes from the Greek word for to seem. And this movement taught that Jesus was not really a human being. He only appeared to be a human being. It appears that these false teachers had embraced this teaching, docetism. That's why John mentions the full humanity of Christ here in this passage. He says that because they are rejecting the full humanity of Christ, this is a false teaching. It is heretical. Because Christianity teaches the full humanity of Jesus, that Jesus was 100% human, as human as you are. And this is something that was later codified in the Nicene Creed of 325. It's long been held to be a part of Orthodox Christianity, something that every true Christian upholds. And it's more important than you might think. Because you see, the penalty for sin is not a fine, nor is it that you have to have one of your animals be killed. The penalty for human sin is a human death. And it is only by becoming fully human that Jesus could die a human death to pay the penalty for human sins. If Jesus were not human, he could not stand in the place of humans and die their death. That's why it's so, so key. You can't throw this one out or you end up in some kind of heresy. Second non-negotiable belief we see here, that Jesus is the Christ. John calls him Jesus Christ, but as I've said many times before, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a title that Christians ascribe to Jesus. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king, whom the prophets of the Old Testament looked forward to as the king whom God would send to deliver and save his people. Jesus is that person 
That is what we proclaim as Christians. He is the Christ. When he came, he saved us. He saved us not by overthrowing political powers and installing an earthly kingdom, but by giving his life to atone for our sins so that in the process he might establish a kingdom of his own. This is another non-negotiable Christian belief. It's a mark of Christian orthodoxy. Any so-called Christian movement that rejects this is not actually Christian. But this belief in our day is much more controversial. You see, most every atheist would ascribe to the belief that Jesus was fully human, right? But no atheist is going around confessing that Jesus really is the Christ who atoned for our sins by paying the penalty for those sins on the cross. That is not a belief that is going to get traction in the world. In fact, even many people who call themselves Christians don't hold that belief. There are millions of people who identify as Christian, who go to church regularly, who say they love Jesus, who are trying to love others in their life, and yet they do not hold to this belief that Jesus is the Christ who saved us from the penalty for sin by dying on a cross to make atonement for us. Because what they do is they start with the basic teaching that God is love which is certainly true, that's in the Bible. But what they do is they take that teaching God is love and God calls us to love. And then they extrapolate the rest of theology based on their understanding of what that means. So they say, well, God isn't actually going to send people to hell for their sins. He's a God of love and that wouldn't be loving. Loving. And likewise, Jesus then didn't come to pay off some debt that we have as sinners. That's not what he was here to do. He came to show us the depths of love and the way of love, to set a moral example for us so we could be inspired to live lives of love like he did and to seek justice for the oppressed and to make the world a better place. And this is the version of Christianity that is espoused by most churches within mainline Protestant denominations. I'm not going to go into all the specific denominations, but generally, if you go to a church that says we are not evangelical and we are not Catholic, but we are a Christian church, then this is the teaching that you are probably going to hear in that church. Basically, that Jesus we love Jesus. He is an inspiring example of love. He was an amazing teacher. But uh, it's, it's those conservative evangelicals who are all obsessed with making atonement and that kind of stuff. They're all into talking about sin and punishment. But we understand. We understand that when the Bible's talking about sin and the punishment for sin, it's using ancient language that people would just use in those days to try to get people to do the right thing. And we understand that. We can see through that. So what we do is we just try to live how Jesus lived. We try to focus on him. Now, again, I'm, I'm saying don't believe this. I'm saying that's, that's what the, the teaching is. I'm saying that this is what you would hear in a sermon in many mainline churches this Sunday. And this teaching used to be called theological liberalism, which is not the same as political liberalism. For a while, uh, this teaching was embraced by a movement called the Emergent Church and by popular teachers like Rob Bell. Maybe you've heard of him. More recently, it's been embraced by a new movement called Progressive Christianity, uh, which includes popular authors like Jen Hatmaker and the late Rachel Held Evans. I want to be clear, this is not true Christianity. It is less than Christianity. These movements emphasize practice and the morality of Jesus, which is a good thing in itself. We are supposed to love others like Jesus. We are supposed to try to imitate him. All Christians should agree with that. 
But these, these movements are reducing Christianity to just that. And in the process, they portray Jesus as someone who is less than the Christ. They claim to be Christian, but as John says, you must not believe every spirit you hear. You must test every teaching against the word of God and cling to what God says, even if you would prefer to believe or to practice something else. John makes this clear in verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. What you heard was coming and now is in the world already. If a movement or a church is not confessing Jesus in this way, as fully human, and also as the Christ, as the Messiah who saved us from the power and penalty of sin on the cross, then that movement is not from God. That movement is being propelled by something else. It's being propelled, John says, by the spirit of the Antichrist which has long been at work in the world and which will one day in some sense be incarnated in a literal human antichrist figure who will lead the charge against Jesus Christ and his church. In verse 5, John explains where this teaching is coming from. It's not coming from heaven. It is coming from the world. And he notes some of the implications that follow from that fact. He says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. John makes an interesting connection here. Because this false teaching has its origins in the world, it is spoken and comes from the vantage point of the world which is why it reflects the values and perspectives of the world. And because it is a world-derived, world-reflecting teaching, the world will listen to it and accept it. The world can approve of this kind of Christianity and is not offended by it because it is a Christianized interpretation of the world and expression of the world. In John's day, this false teaching resonated with the world's embrace of Greek philosophy, which posited this huge gap between the physical world and the spiritual world. So people in the world in John's day liked this teaching that Jesus could not be truly human. They liked the idea that he was not the Christ. These claims appealed to them because they resonated with reason, and what they loved was to reason and to live a life based on reason. And so this false teaching didn't offend them like the true gospel did. In our day, the predominant false teaching that rejects the full messiahship of Jesus is one that the world embraces because, well, what's left is love and tolerance and not judging people just the ethics of Jesus. And those are values that are already in the world, values that even secular people think we should embrace as ethics of how to live. So when they hear about this kind of Christianity, the world is not offended by it. The world doesn't think it's bad. It's palatable to them. Because this teaching reflects much of what the world already believes about religion, which is that the religion is not really there to get hung up on the doctrine. It's really there to teach people to love people. And so a movement like progressive Christianity, which rejects the substitutionary atonement of Christ, and in many cases, the existence of hell, even the virgin birth, and a number of other things, because it's, it starts by just saying, okay, God is love, and what can we extrapolate from there? This is ultimately then a movement that it claims the name of Christ, but it is ultimately coming from the world, which is why it reflects the world's values and why it is palatable to the world as an okay and respectable kind of Christian faith. And then in turn, because it is respected in the world 
and not reject it as something that is an outdated or offensive form of Christianity. Many Christians are attracted to this kind of Christianity because it sounds like, hey, you can be a Christian, you can embrace this, let it give you meaning in your life, and you can still be respected by non-Christians. Sounds like it's the best of both worlds. But here's the thing, it's not truly Christian because this movement is leaving behind several non-negotiables of Christianity, including the atonement of Christ, the reality of hell, and even the authority of the inspired scriptures. And that's the third non-negotiable Christian belief that these false teachers were discarding, even as they claimed the name of Christ. Take a look at verses five and six. John says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The contrast that John draws here is one of listening. He says, those who are of the world will listen to this false teaching because it is worldly, but those who are from God, those who are born again, the true Christians, they will not listen to that false teaching. They will listen to us. True Christians listen to the apostles of Jesus. That's the us here. Because they recognize that the apostles are speaking with God's own authority and are writing scripture under God's supernatural inspiration. And this is the third non-negotiable belief of Christianity, that the scriptures of both the Old Testament and the New Testament were inspired by the Holy Spirit and are therefore utterly trustworthy and authoritative in all that they declare. No movement of so-called Christianity can rightfully be called a Christian movement if it rejects this. We would also add that scripture is without error. It's inerrant for the very same reason that God is inspired and God doesn't lie. But in this particular verse, John emphasizes the authority of scripture itself or the authority of the people whom God sends to give authorized teaching, whether it was the apostles as they were speaking, you know, with their mouth or as they were writing with their pen. The question at issue is, were the apostles inspired by God as they wrote the New Testament so that they were not just writing with God's authority, but were actually writing God's words to us? Scripture. Or were these apostles flawed sinners trying to follow Jesus just as we are? People who were not divinely inspired and therefore whose writings betray their limited knowledge, their ancient understandings, some of kind of their flawed ancient morality. Now this is another uh, place where progressive Christianity, as I said, is discarding a non-negotiable, along with other theologically liberal movements of our day. Uh, you might hear a progressive Christian say something like, I like what Matthew says about this in his gospel, but I don't agree with what Paul says about it in Romans. There's this sense that the Bible, it's great, it is inspiring, but it is not inspired in the sense that those other Christians believe it is. That the Bible is helpful, it's good, but it's something that we can improve upon by incorporating some of our more enlightened, more modern beliefs about morality and truth. And this approach to the Bible is why progressive Christianity can reject the Bible's teaching that homosexuality is a sin. There's this assumption that sometimes the Bible gets it wrong. And so we can't treat it as the absolute authority, even on issues of morality, because it's written by sinners. Instead, they say it's, it's our sense of what Christ's love is that is the real authority. And so even other parts of the New Testament or verses in the New Testament 
we can reject them when they do not resonate with what we consider to be love. But true Christianity holds that the Bible is utterly authoritative in all that it declares and that no part of it can be rejected, even if you disagree with that part or even find it offensive because it is God's own inspired word and it has authority over you. You are not the authority over the Bible. The Bible is the authority over you because the Bible is God's word and he is the authority. This is a non-negotiable Christian belief. Any movement that rejects this is less than Christian. So you must not join any church that rejects the full humanity of Jesus or the full messiahship of Jesus, that he died on the cross to save us from our sins, or the full authority of the Bible as the inspired and authoritative word of God. Even if it seems like it's a great church, even if you'd like the people there, those are not your primary criteria that you should use to assess whether you should be a part of that church. It's not just about what you like or where you feel comfortable. There are so many versions of Christianity that are available in our culture to us, but a good number of them we need to reject out of hand because they don't hold to these non-negotiables of Christianity. At the very least, you need to make sure that you attend a church that lifts up the Bible as the inspired, inerrant, and the word of God, and that lifts up Jesus as the Son of God who became human to save us by dying for our sins on a cross and rose from the dead. Those need to be your non-negotiables as you're thinking about what to believe and what to associate yourself with. Don't believe every spirit. And don't try out every product in the spiritual marketplace. Some of them can be dangerous. You need to be discerning. You need to test every offering against what God says in his words. Don't just look for a version of Christianity that appeals to you and resonates with you. That kind of logic could very well lead you into a church that is a reflection of the world rather than a reflection of Christ. You have to start with doctrine, with what they teach. If a church or a Christian movement is rejecting one of these non-negotiable Christian beliefs, stay away from it. It's not good for you. We need to learn what God says in our Bibles so we can be prepared to test the churches and movements and doctrines and teachings of our time against the timeless truths of God's word. So we might keep going in the one true faith as a member of the one true church of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us those of us who are in uh, some kind of spiritual fog right now, we're dealing with doubts of one kind or another, uh, confusion in our life, we're questioning things. Uh, we pray that you would lead us out of the fog, that you would hold our hand and walk us through it, leading us by your spirit and by your word into what is true and right and something we can build our life upon. I pray that you would protect all of us from uh, false teaching, let us not embrace that or let that into our life, but be able to discern where it contradicts the scriptures. And help us to really savor and enjoy these non-negotiable truths of Christianity. Help us to understand why they're so important so we can champion them fully and not go anywhere near um, any kind of teaching that says that they're not true. We know that uh, you are the one who is going to build your church. But the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And so we, we praise you for that, for your ability to preserve your church through every wind of false teaching and doctrine that might go around it, that you keep your people faithful. And we pray that you would help us to be faithful to you, to walk in the truth that you reveal in your word, that in your light we might see the light and find our way in the way of love toward Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.